was months after that I'd come up for my parole review. And I was expecting that word that the old timer said, parole denied. <laughs> We've gone over your record and so forth. And it's been decided that you'll be granted parole. And we understand you're going to Ottawa to stay with your aunt and uncle. And you will have a fresh start in society. So I went over there. I was surprised and I told everyone else and they were all happy for me and pat me on the back and say good for you Jim good you're getting out and we hope you do good. When the day came they took me to the reception and discharge area and I was being escorted down to the train stop area with one of the guards and uh, he was one of the guards that didn't provoke and agitate prisoners. He was considered one that went by the rules and regulations, but he wasn't a uh, real agitator. There's $50 in there and a one-way ticket to Ottawa. Your train's coming. Jim, I wish you all the best. Hey, Jimmy, don't come back. I'll do my best. And of course, I boarded the train, went to Ottawa, and uh, things did not work out in Ottawa. I tried to get work washing dishes in restaurants, uh, car wash. I would have taken anything that was available to me, but I couldn't find any employment. So then the thought went through my mind, I need money to buy things I want, I want to be able to take a girlfriend out to a movie, uh, I want to be able to get a car, nice clothes. And then the thought went through my mind, well, Rene told me how to open these safes. And he told me what tools I needed. And I said, if he was telling me the truth, I'll find out. And I went and cased this one business Got everything I needed, and I broke into the place. It took me a while. I got the safe open. I got all the money, got away from there. I went and bought a, a 1955 Pontiac, and uh, I got myself a handgun, and I started practicing using it in the way I was instructed, and I became very accurate with it. And then I got to the point where I realized I have to leave Ottawa. I, I'm going to break my parole. And I got in my car, which I had hidden a few blocks from there, and I drove all the way to Halifax to team up with a, an old friend of mine who was in the reform school with me so I could start robbing banks with him. And when I got to Halifax, I ended up being apprehended. So you tried to go back to Ottawa. You had some plans didn't work out with your aunt. Um, you went back to Halifax, you got arrested. You ended up going back to Dorchester. Yeah. yeah I ended up going back to Dorchester and my, my youngest brother had been killed by a car that hurt me quite a bit uh, during that time on my last escape. Hmm. And I was at Dorchester there and I was angry with myself. The whole situation, I think it was two more years, and uh, I, kn I knew I wouldn't get a parole. So uh, I finished that off and I got released. I went to Halifax and I got a part-time job working on the waterfront as a freight handler, then a full-time job working at Twin City Dairies. But then there was a detective who kept stopping my car and searching it and harassing me. And eventually he told the uh, uh, person, the personnel manager, Mr. Stockley, at the uh, dairy about my record. And uh, anyway, they let me go. And I just saw red after that. And I went back to the streets and I started robbing and stealing and I got caught and I, <clears throat> I was sentenced back to Dorchester for four years for break-in or theft of uh, a box of 12 handguns. And uh, 
for an armed robbery. I was given seven years for concurrent, and I was sent back into Dorchester. And I thought, uh, this is never going to end. And uh, I just became worse and worse. And uh, any time I would encounter a problem in the prison, I handled it in a violent way. Mm. And if there was any sort of mischievous stuff going on with contraband and that, I was involved in some shape or form in it. And uh, there was a fellow prisoner in there who was a friend of mine. And uh, it seemed like every day he would keep harping on this informant who told on him in court and had him sentenced to the prison for his offense. And now the, this informant was living with his wife and uh, that was within a few weeks of being released. And we're in the weight pit working out. And uh, I told him, I said, uh, Georgie, I've heard enough of this. Will you shut up? I don't want to hear any more about it. You're driving me crazy. And I said, I'll get the informant. I'll get that rat. I'll kill him for you. So shut up. And uh, anyway, uh, I was released from there. So, Cav and I, I've, I've got to take you to the bus station. This is my rat. Oh, Jimmy. And I was on my way to shoot and kill this informant when the RCMP officers uh, pulled the car over for a routine check. And I told the individuals that were in the front seats, I said, uh, pull the car over, keep it in gear. I said, I'm going to shoot these two RCMP officers. And they were in shock. I, w I was totally out of control at that point. I was full of hate and anger. And uh, I hated uh, uh, those in authority at that time. And uh, when the police officer approached the vehicle, I already had the window wound down. And I stuck the shotgun out, pointed it straight at him. He froze. And uh, he was maybe four feet, five feet away from the end of the barrel. When I pulled the trigger, and all there was was a click. And the gun had malfunctioned. That saved his life and ultimately mine too. And I told the driver, I said, hit the gas and get out of here. And, and we sped away. There was a chase and other police agencies got involved in, in the chase. There was an exchange of gunfire where one police officer did get sh shot and wounded. They arrested me and I was given uh, two more uh, sentences, 15 year sentence for each attempted murder, which I pled guilty to. And two weeks later, I escaped when they were taking me in for a court appearance uh, on behalf of a, one of my co accused who was charged up on the charge. I told Matt, I'll take the charge, just put a subpoena to get me out so I can get a chance to escape. And I escaped on them, and I was on the run for two days through the woods. And uh, they had a helicopter uh, after me and a, a plane, RCMP, German Shepherd tracking dog. And I would backtrack and, uh, on my tracks and uh, throw them off the trail. But they spotted me uh, when I was near Moncton. Yeah, I was given two more years for the escape and I was taken back to Dorchester until I was transferred from there to Millhaven Maximum Penitentiary in Ontario. I guess I'm curious about the, the ultimate motivation. Uh, you felt that it was uh, something you had to do for this other inmate you were uh, working out with, that you had to do him a favor? Well, it. It was the mindset that I had back at that time. My mindset back then, I, I hated informants, mm -hmm. and I had an informant stool pigeon out on me on my seven-year sentence, and I wanted to strike back at him, and I couldn't strike back at him. And when Georgie mentioned this person, to me, it was my opportunity 
to eliminate an informant, hmm. a rat. And I had so much anger and burning inside of me mm -hmm. uh, for the seven years I had to do because of this informant that ratted out on me. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that was part of uh, the reason why I told him, I said, uh, look, I'll kill the guy for you when I'm released. Mm -hmm. You thought you would succeed in this? Well, I, I knew if I would have got to the point of meeting the person, mm -hmm. I certainly would have succeeded in it because uh, I knew I was going to get a weapon and I knew I was capable of doing it and uh, I would have carried it out. And it was fortunate for that person, as well as myself, that the police did come. But then again, uh, those police officers didn't know what circumstances they were walking into. Mm -hmm. They didn't know what went through my life mm -hmm. to bring me to the point yeah. of where I'm prepared to take their life mm -hmm. when they'd done nothing to me. Mm -hmm. I was right out of control mm -hmm. and willing to hurt anyone that got in my way. Mm -hmm. You had nothing to lose. You weren't afraid of being shot and killed. No, I thought death would have been more welcomed to me than to lead the life that I was le leading and going through the circumstances I was going through. Yeah. I thought there was nothing worth, worthwhile to live for. Hmm. Okay, so you went back to jail mm -hmm. to serve a long sentence, being charged with attempted murder of police officers. Mm -hmm. So back in you went yep. for a long haul. Mm -hmm. And at Millhaven, uh, I found it to be a totally, totally nuthouse. Everyone was in altercations with each other. They were beating each other with steel bars, stabbing one another, cutting their arms up, uh, slashing themselves, hurting themselves. And I knew that I had to be very violent to survive in that setting. And uh, I had different altercations, which I came out on top on. And in one situation, uh, there was a, another young prisoner on the same range as I was. And when I came onto the range, I went by his cell and I said, hi, Det, how are you? And I was expecting, not too bad. But as I went by, there was no response. Dad, what's wrong? Did you get some bad news from home? Listen, Dad, talk to me. What's wrong? Uh, Jimmy, do you think you can um, get me a knife? Yeah, I can get you a knife. Good, thanks. What do you want it for? I got some problems I need to take care of. What kind of problems? I keep getting hassled for sex. That guy Dave forces me to have sex. I'm gonna stab him in the back. No, you're not, Dad. He's gonna take that knife from you and he's gonna kill you. I'm gonna kill him. Listen. I know the guy, okay? I'll talk to him. Tell him to leave you alone. I'm going to kill him. So I went and approached David in his cell. David's six foot, 200 pounds or more. I gotta talk to you. So what? I know what you're doing with this young guy, Detmeyer. He's got enough on his plate, serving his time. He doesn't have to worry about you. I want you to leave him alone. do what I want. I'll get out of my cell. So now it's personal. And that made my blood boil. I was just... I wanted to act out right there in the cell and fight with him right there. But he had his weapon drawn on me. I said, okay. And I backed out of the cell. And I went and got a weapon. And later on, I came back and when I thought the time was right, 
and there was no one around at the right opportunity. I had that window of opportunity where nobody could see if I got into an altercation with him. I went into his cell and the knife was still in my pocket with a handkerchief around it, around the handle. And I told him, I said, you owe me an apology and I want to hear you're going to leave that mire alone. And I killed the man and I didn't care. And I didn't have no feeling about it whatsoever. I just took the man's life and uh, exited his cell, got rid of my clothing. I left a knife in him. Inmates started coming in on the ranges. And there was one young guy that had just been transferred in there from Workworth Institution for running away from there. And uh, his cell was directly across from the deceased, David. And when he came to his cell, he looked over and he seen the dead body on the floor and he went into shock. The dead guy's dead. These things happen in prison. You just gotta mind your own business. And he walked down to the end of the range and he spoke to some guys down there and I guess he related the same thing to them. That there's a dead guy down there, somebody killed the guy. And one of the guys in that group turned on him and said, you better shut your so-and-so most or maybe you'll be next. And I laid on my bed and I could hear the guard coming down doing his count. And when he looked into the deceased cell, David's cell, he hollered, one down, one down, and he kept running down the corridor to the main tower. And then in came the medical people along with other guards, and then later the pen squad investigation team came. And the nurse, of course, pronounced the, the prisoner dead. And then there was a big investigation. And eventually, this kid pointed at me and accused me and the other guy who threatened him. And he said that he saw me kill the guy and that the other guy was present. And it was false. There was nobody there. And later I went through a trial and we were both found guilty, both given life sentences. I was transferred to Prince Albert. He was transferred to a prison in Quebec. And I was thinking through my mind, how am I going to get this innocent man off? I can't tell him that, yeah, I am the guy who did it. I am the guilty person, because next thing you know, I'll have him up there on the jury or, or the stand telling the jury that I told him that I did it. That's what I was fearful of. But when I went back on a new trial, because they didn't have enough evidence and the uh, statements that the guy made couldn't stand up. I uh, was told by my lawyer that the Crown thinks I'm crazy. I was in for two attempted murders charge, the shootout with the police and so forth. They never ever want to see me in society again. And I said, oh, they, he said that I was crazy? He says, yeah. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll make a deal. I'll plead not guilty by reason of insanity at the time if they dropped a charge on the co-accused, then they'll own me for the rest of my life. And they went for that deal, and uh, I was found not guilty by reason of insanity at the time. And uh, I was supposed to go to Penetang Machine for the criminally insane, but instead, they got special permission to warehouse me in Millhaven in a range called the Special Handling Unit. And that was designated for those that they considered the most dangerous prisoners from all the pr maximum prisons across Canada, mm -hmm. whether they be high escape risk, danger to staff, or danger to other prisoners. Mm -hmm. And that's where I found myself in the special handling unit in mm -hmm. Mill For years to come. Yeah. yeah. Well, how did you live with yourself after that experience? Again, I was, I was still in a state where I didn't care if I lived or died. Yeah. 
if another prisoner killed me, it wouldn't have mattered. And if another prisoner bothers me, I'm going to put them in the hospital or I'm going to kill them and I don't care. Mm -hmm. And that was the frame of mind I was in. Mm -hmm. Then one Christmas, I received a Christmas card. And when I opened it up, a business card fell out of it and I picked it up and I looked at it and it said, Ernie Hollins, Christian Witness. And I said, Ernie Hollins? I said, I know a Jimmy Hollins, my friend Jimmy. I said, I knew in Dorchester when I went into Dor Dorchester when I was 15 years old. My friend, the bank robber. I said, this must be his brother. Hmm. And I wrote him a letter back. Dear Ernie, thank you for the Christmas card. I knew a Jimmy Hollins. He was a good friend. He was chairman of the prisoners committee. Are you his brother? Dear Jim, praise the Lord. No, I am the one and the same person you knew in Dorchester. When I was in prison, I went by the name Jimmy, but my Christian given name is Ernie. I'm married to a lovely Christian lady named Sheila. I will see if I can get permission to visit you. This time when Ernie came to visit me and talked to me through the glass at the visiting booth, when the es guard escorted me down from the special handling unit, Have a good visit, Hey, Jimmy. Great to see you. It's good to see you too, Ernie. How you doing? You holding up? Yeah. Yeah, I'm holding up. Thanks for coming to visit me. Yeah, 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 sure. Hey, have you heard from your family? Yeah, yeah, I hear from them from time to time, you know. Uh, listen, how's Sheila and the kids? Great, great, they're great. And then Sheila sends her love and prayers. Hey, listen, Jimmy, you know, I'm on my way to Bermuda. You know, I'm gonna attend a full gospel businessmen's meeting. And then I'm gonna go to a prison just to tell them how Jesus Christ changed my life. Bermuda, eh? Listen, send me a postcard. Oh, I will, I will, yeah. I'll hang it up in my cell. Great. Uh, listen, Jimmy, can you do me a favor? Sure, what is it? Would you pray for me? Pray? Yeah. Yeah, would you pray for me? Would you do that for me? Okay, Ernie, I'll pray for you. Great. Good. You know, Ernie, you've changed a lot. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I am a changed man, and you can be too, Jimmy. I don't know about that. Jimmy, do you mind before I go? Can I pray for you? Okay. Lord God Almighty, take the hand of Jimmy and minister him spiritually and physically and keep him safe from harm in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God is with you, Jimmy. I know he is. God's with you too. And remember, Jimmy, always remember, God loves you. And Sheila and I love you, too. Okay, Time's up. But I'm from the old school where you give your word to a friend, you keep it. So I said, yeah, Ernie, I'll, I'll pray for you. So the guard escorted me back to the special handling unit. And that night, after the guard made the last round, I watched through the slot in my cell door. And I heard the barrier close. I kneeled down by the side of my bed, as my grandmother used to get me to do when I prayed when I was a kid. Dear God, watch out over my friend Ernie. Be with him as he travels to Bermuda. May some of the prisoners there listen to what he's got to say. Watch out over his wife, Sheila, and their kids as well. Amen. But one night in June, 1978, I can't tell you the date because I was too shook up. After praying for everyone else, I said a simple prayer for myself. I said, Lord, forgive me for my sins. Give me the strength, patience, and wisdom for to get through each day. Amen. And I had a warmth that went through my entire body and that shook me up, mm -hmm. an internal warmth. Mm -hmm. And I sat in my bed 
trying to analyze it, saying, what was that I experienced there? What was that? And then after thinking on it for so long, I said, I'll find out if it happens tomorrow night. So the next night I prayed for everyone and I said that prayer again. Lord, forgive me for my sins. Give me the strength, patience, and wisdom for to get through each day. And I had that warmth again. I broke down and I cried that night. I cried just like a little child. And I believe God took that heart of stone out and put a heart of flesh back in. Mm -hmm. But I still couldn't understand it. I, 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 I couldn't comprehend what was happening. So I said to myself, well, I'll find out if I experience it the next night. I, I refer to it as the doting Thomas experience. I, I went back the third night on my knees and prayed, and I didn't receive that warmth. Then there was a voice in the back of my mind, just like I'm talking to you, but it was in the back of my mind, that said, you're going to lose your friends. No one will want to speak to you. People will think you're going crazy. And I, I think that was the voice of the enemy trying to get me to not take or accept what I experienced the two previous nights. Mm -hmm. But I got the attention of my friend in the next cell, Eddie. 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 Yeah, Jim? I've got to tell you something. What's going on? This friend of mine asked me to pray for him. I told him I would, so I did. You know, the first few nights, I just prayed for him, and the third night, I, I prayed that God would forgive my sins, and to give me the strength, patience, and courage to get through each day. And then this warm feeling came over my whole body. I didn't really understand it. Are you, uh, you going sideways on me, Jimmy? No. I said, no, Eddie. I said, I'm not going crazy. I don't understand it all, but there's a spiritual experience that I've experienced. And I said, there's a spiritual reality that's there that exists. I said, I don't understand it all. And I said, uh, I said, I believe that God is trying to reach me. And Eddie said, well, if it's going to help you, Jimmy, all the power to you. And then I wrote Ernie and I told him the experiences I went through. And uh, he and Sheila wrote me back and they kept encouraging me to get a Bible from the chaplain and the chaplain at that time brought me a Bible and Ernie said to go to the Gospel of John and start reading there where Nicodemus is speaking to Jesus and Jesus is telling him that which is of flesh is flesh but that which is of spirit is spirit and you must be born again and he was trying to get across to me this born again experience and I still couldn't understand what he's talking about but as I read the scripture I was starting to understand it was being revealed to me being born again within sight of you and having a new spirit a rebirth on the inside and uh, as I read God's word he revealed more and more to me and uh, it came to the point where I stopped being involved in violence I stopped substance abuse and at that time, I was the conduit for all the contraband getting into the special handling unit. Mm -hmm. And I told the other guys, you guys want it? Here's the avenue. You take it. I got nothing more to do with it. Mm -hmm. And the prisoners watched me week after week, month after month. And they said, what's happened to Jimmy? He's not having to do anything with what's going on here. And if they wanted me to share with them, I would share with them and tell them my experience and what's affected me. The guards thought it was a game, of course. And then a year later, I suffered an aneurysm in my back. 
Hello, Mr. Kavanaugh. Nice to see you again. Well? Jim, the x-rays show there's something in your spinal column. We need to do exploratory surgery to determine exactly what it is, but my best guess is that it's an aneurysm. The surgery will fix it? I, I can't know that for certain, Jim, but we need to do the surgery right away. Uh, I'll book it. After coming out of the operation and the doctor telling me I'd never walk again, I'd be bound to a wheelchair or a bed for the rest of my life, I cried out to the Lord in prayer and I said, I, I don't understand this, Lord. I was already in prison for the rest of my life. Now I'm imprisoned within my own body. Why? And I prayed and I said, Lord, you know I want a wife and family before I leave this earth, restore me. And humanistically, it looked like an impossibility. But uh, I kept praying and kept working at it. And it took months after they put me in Collins Bay Institution to get from the wheelchair to walk so many yards with the canes. And then at one point, uh, another prisoner by the nickname of Meatball, Jimmy Mete, he was pushing me out to the exercise yard. Well, there you go. Thanks, Meatball. Hey, Meatball. Yeah. How long do you think it is around the big yard? About a quarter mile. Maybe one day I'll walk. I hope you do, Jimmy. See you later. As Jimmy was walking away, a voice in the back of my mind, just like I'm talking to you, said, why not now? And I obeyed that voice. I pushed myself up out of the wheelchair, anchored my two canes, and I started walking one step and then another. It took me 55 minutes to make that circuit and fall in the wheelchair so with sweat and pain and a lot of hurt. And I said, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. And I continued on in my walk mm -hmm. of faith. Mm -hmm. And I got to the point where I could walk with one cane at one point. Mm -hmm. And of course, I was also eligible to apply for parole for release. And I applied and was denied. <laughs> I was applied and denied. And I still had that desire to someday be released to society and hopefully have a normal life, but it still looked like an impossibility. But the day came, God appointed the, the day, and I went before the parole board, and they granted me what's called day passes under escort with a guard, and then so many months under the escort of a citizen escort, and then a day parole to a halfway house, then full parole. And uh, at that point, uh, I was readjusting into society and trying to uh, work at a shoe repair place and, and adjust to the community. Transformation. Transformation. All those years running away from, mm -hmm finally had something to run to. Yeah. Awesome. Only by the strength of the Lord. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, so you had this dream that you would be free, mm -hmm. get to the street, have a normal life, mm -hmm. opportunity to have a wife and children. Did it happen? Yes, if it didn't, I wouldn't be here, I'll tell you that. But uh, after uh, being invited to uh, Picton, Ontario, to share in a tent crusade about my conversion, and uh, I was approached by a volunteer named David Cheese, who was a faithful volunteer every Sunday in Collins Bay Institution before I was released. He said to me, he said, I have somebody that you should meet, Jim. And I said, sure, David, and I didn't think no more of it. I went back to Sudbury. And later on, he approached my wife, Shirley, and told her about me. And uh, she said, don't be bringing them around my host, David. And he said, well, I got a, 
videotape where Jimmy's given his testimony. Will you look at that? And she looked at that tape. And the Lord gave her confirmation within her spirit that it'd be all right to meet me. And uh, so she met with me at a restaurant. Um, when David first mentioned you to me, he told me that you were an ex-prisoner. And I told him, don't be bringing him around my house. It was your testimony at that tent crusade in Picton. I felt in my spirit the Lord telling me that it would be okay to meet you. She felt comfortable with me because she knew other people in the church around who were volunteers going into the prison. And I asked her if I could write to her and if I could visit her when I come back to Kingston area and she said yes. And this went on for two years. But I was still wondering how I was going to tell my father that I was dating an ex-convict. <laughs> I didn't know how he was going to react. How do you think I felt when you told me he was an RCMP officer? <sighs> like running? No. I stopped running. And then I asked the parole for permission to go down for Christmas to stay uh, there and meet her parents and that. And uh, of course, they played games and said no. But eventually it came to the point where I applied to be transferred to Kingston on my parole. It was granted and uh, prior to that, I had written Shirley a letter and I enclosed a ring that I had bought in a jewelry store and I asked her if she would marry me. And when I phoned her and I talked to her, I said, did you get the letter and the ring? She said, yes. And I said, what is your answer? And she said, yes, I will marry you. Then I was working with other uh, individuals that were getting out of the prison. I would meet them at times and encourage them, and they'd be an encouragement to me too. And I was doing my shoe repair. And one volunteer said, Jimmy, we need somebody to go back into the prisons to share with the men and women in prison and encourage them. And I said, I don't want to go back in there. I, I lost 20 years of my life in prison. I don't want to go back in there. And uh, as I was doing the shoe repair work, uh, a voice said, Ernie Holmes came in to visit you. Can you not go back in and visit the men? And I would see images of prisoners in my mind's eye who I knew that were still at certain time. So I believe God put that conviction on me to go back into prison. Then I started going back in. And my parole was getting to the point where it was almost expired. And my wife and I were planning to go down to Nova Scotia to visit my parents, like a family reunion. And uh, I didn't know all of them were going to be there at the time. It was a surprise. And uh, I went to the parole office and I told the, the parole supervisor, Mr. Cunningham, I said, uh, look, my uh, parole expires when I'm down in Nova Scotia on this pass. What do I do? do? Is there papers I have to sign? He says, oh, I forgot about that. He says, you were in my office so many times helping other prisoners. He says, I, I forgot that you were still on parole. He said, no, you don't have to worry about anything. You go and enjoy your visit with your parents. And uh, so I went down with Shirley. We traveled down and uh, met my mom and dad. And... Uh, they surprised me and they had a big table with steak and lobster and all kinds of food. It was like welcoming home the prodigal son. <laughs> and they had contacted all of my sisters and brothers and my uh, 
other relatives and they were they all came there and we all got together for a good meal and when it was time for us to leave how did you get everyone to come together <laughs> threats <laughs> yeah did you tell her yet tell me what The supervision on my parole is over. I want you to have this. It's my parole card. I'm completely free from the system. That's the end of that, son. So the beginning of this story uh, was a very sad one. Mm as it relates to family interaction, difficulty with your dad and drinking and all of that mm -hmm. trauma in your early life. Mm -hmm. At the end of this story, uh, or, or much later on, mm -hmm. uh, how, how, how did that play out with your parents and the, the uh, alcohol use, the, the family dynamic? Mm -hmm. Well, my father, came to the point in his life where he finally gave up drinking. Oh. And my mother and father got along great and uh, raised the rest of the children until they left home. And uh, one of discussion I had with my mom over all the difficulties that happened in the past, one thing she said to me, she said, well, Son, I would never have wanted to be married to anyone other than your father. Mm. It was the alcohol that caused him to act out the way he did because your father has always been one of the kindest persons to me and you kids. It was that alcohol that turned him into a monster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, when I was in prison and getting letters from them, I was very happy to see that he had quit drinking alcohol and everything was fine in the family setting. And, uh, but it, it wasn't fine with me in the prison setting. Yeah. So long as I have breath within me, yeah. I'm going to share with those that are incarcerated in prisons that their lives can be changed mm -hmm. through prayer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. God is just waiting for them to reach out to him in prayer, mm -hmm. as I did. If it were not so, I would not be here talking to you. Mm -hmm. If God did not bring Ernie Holmes back to talk to me, I would not be here talking to you. Mm -hmm. God knew he was the only person that I would be open to listen to mm -hmm. from my whole connection with people. Mm -hmm. And I thank God for bringing Ernie Hollins back into my life mm -hmm. and for changing my life for that transformation. Wow. And I was going to ask you a question, mm -hmm. which you just answered for me, that you've been for 22 years giving a message back to prisoners. Mm -hmm. And if you were to give a message today to the prisoners who are watching this DVD, yeah. what would that message be? You've pretty much answered that question, yeah. but again, any, any other message that's pinnacle? The message I, I would give is that I know that just like I was, many of those that may view this DVD may think that they're in a hopeless situation and there is no answer to it. And I can confirm to them from my heart that all they have to do is reach out to God in prayer, forgive themselves for the mistakes they've made, mm -hmm. and through prayer ask God to give them the ability to forgive those who have hurt them in the past so they get through, rid of those hurts in their subconscious mind. Mm -hmm. And allow God to work in their 
life. Get a Bible and read it and study it and let God minister unto them through his word, which he will. Mm -hmm. I know it to be a fact because he has for me. Mm -hmm. And me. And he will set them free. Mm 